so this speaker series, in case you weren't aware, follows from a climate change speaker series that took place last spring. And this, that series featured speakers who worked within the United Nations organization. And during that series, students asked critical questions about the role of the UN in averting climate change and about their own roles in stemming the impending crisis. Their questions were part of the inspiration for this speaker series on popular responses and environmental justice. So here we are, one year later, one very hot year later. And it has been hot in several ways. As we know, both NASA and NOAA have concluded that 2014 was the hottest ever recorded. Intergov the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change warned in their fifth assessment report that the situation is dire, that the time for mitigation is running out, and that the peril that some people face now and that others face imminently is the result of nearly 200 years of fossil, fa fossil fuel-based industrialization. And as we know, this industrialization process has been uneven both between and within countries. At the beginning of November this past year, the world's two leading polluters, the US and China, agreed to reduce their future carbon emissions, generating hope for a multinational agreement at a meeting in Lima, Peru, one month later. Their representatives of, con of 190 countries met to forge a new agreement on greenhouse gas emissions. Yet this meeting, like so many of the ones before it, was mired in divisions between economically developed countries and economically developing ones between those that benefited from the industrial processes that respon were responsible for climate change and those that have been victim to those industrial processes and to the climate change those processes have wrought. Though an agreement was signed in Lima, the promise of a, promise of a binding agreement necessary to stem the tide of an unabated climate change remains doubtful. But also in this very hot year, as international discussions stagnated, 300,000 people from all walks of life and from many parts of Earth, marched in New York in September. Together, they argued that the geographically and socially uneven environmental impacts of climate change were directly connected to the very same political, economic, and social relationships and processes that protesters in Ferguson, Missouri, decried one month earlier, and that other protesters in New York decried two months earlier. So for many in this march, it was clear that the environmental issues intersected with race, gender, and class. And in this way, I Can't Breathe can be seen not just as an, as an exasperated plea from an unarmed man, but as an exasperated plea from poor and marginalized communities of all skin tones suffering from the externalities of industry. And just as those protesters in Ferguson called for fundamental changes, so too did the climate marchers in their calls for new socioeconomic, ecological relationships. To the protesters and to many of you in the audience these next few several weeks, the situation is dire, and the inaction or insufficient action by those in power may be making things worse. And as our speakers today and in our coming sessions will discuss, not all hope is lost. They will address their frustrations and successes in securing environmental and climate justice through international, state, market, and technological methods. They'll highlight the interconnectedness of the environment, race, gender, and class. And they'll discuss how individuals like yourselves can organize to be the changes you wish to see in the world. At the end of the introduction in her recent book, This Changes Everything, Naomi Klein writes, nothing is inevitable. Nothing except that climate change changes everything. And for a very brief time, the nature of that change is still up to us. So with that, I would like to introduce Jacqueline Patterson of the NAACP and Amina Maxi of Zero Waste Detroit. Throughout her career, Ms. Patterson has worked in various capacities with organizations, small and large, in the US and abroad on a variety of issues such as women's rights and public health, in addition to climate change. She now serves as the Environmental and Climate Justice Director at the NAACP, working on the connections between race, gender, class, and climate, and creating more, and creating more just visions for the future. Ms. Maxey has spent her career working as an advocate for health and environmental justice in Detroit and Eastern Michigan. She worked with Detroit City Council to draft laws, which since have been enacted, to improve air quality in the city, and thereby improve the health of the city's residents. She now works as the Community Outreach Coordinator at Zero Waste Detroit, 
where she promotes participation in and the expansion of the city's recycling program. So the schedule for today is that Jackie and, or Jacqueline and Amina will each speak for five, about 15 minutes, and then we will open the floor for questions. Then they'll sign off around 5 o'clock, and then those of us who are physically present in the room will have a discussion amongst ourselves about the things that they've said and any other issues that are going on that are relative, relevant to what we've heard today. So with that, Jackie and Amina, welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, Jackie, we'll give it over to you first for the first 15 minutes, and then we'll turn it over to Amina. Right. Okay, Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be with you all today. And um, that because I have to look at my notes, and um, that means I can't see you simultaneously, but hopefully I can <laughs> make this work. Kind of strange to not to see you at the same time. But um, I'll be talking a little bit about the work that we're doing and, and how it fits into the larger climate justice um, realm and, um, and then talking a bit about leadership in the climate justice movement and what that looks like now, how, what we see in terms of a, net, uh, a necessary transformation in leadership in order to make the movement and its impacts um, more uh, effective. And um, and then and then in the end, I'll talk a little bit about kind of ways that I see um, roles that you as emerging leaders and existing leaders um, can help to contribute as we all work together on this in, in some in, in different ways and at different levels. So so the NAACP has started this this work about five years ago and and at, at the beginning of 2010. And we we have uh, branches and chapters throughout the nation, so we work in, in a lot of different circumstances in terms of folks who are impacted by both the drivers of climate change and and the um, and the results of climate change. So when we talk about the drivers, as you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are the are what's driving climate change. So the types of impacts that we see. Are the types of uh, yeah the impacts that we see of the driving of climate change include work it inc include sorry um, include the whether it's coal-fired power plants that are emitting or incinerators that I'm gonna we'll be talking about a bit more um, what, uh, different uh, energy-based energy fossil fuel-based energy production and its impacts near roadway air pollution and so forth. And then on the impact side, we see the shift in agricultural yields or the ways that crops are, are no longer producing in the same way due to either drought or flooding. And we also see the rising seas and how that's taking over land and, 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 and exacerbating storms through storm surge. And then we also see the increase in frequency and severity of extreme weather events. And the communities in which we work, largely African-American communities, but also other communities of color and low-income communities, we see where folks are most vulnerable to these impacts because of either economic issues, um, whether it's folks not having poor housing stock or not having insurance or having their homes in floodplains, or the fact that most um, a lot of these polluting facilities are right in these very communities of color and low income communities and then on the and then we also see on the other side in terms of um in terms of vulnerability in terms of impacts we see where uh, political disenfranchisement also plays a role because you'll you'll have places that aren't necessarily getting the resources that they need to build resilience against against these impacts because of political disenfranchisement. So specifically, um, I work in areas like Gulfport, Mississippi, where they have a coal-fired power plant in the middle of the uh, of their community that that emits so many tons of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide every year. They see, they see high rates of asthma in their community, and at the same time, it's Gulfport, Mississippi, so it's right in the in the Gulf of Mexico, and they've been hit you know year after year. In 2012 with Hurricane Isaac, of course, in 2005 with um, Hurricane Katrina. Katrina, after that Hurricane Rita, and so forth. So they are really at the crosshairs of both the drivers of, of climate change with the um, with that coal plant being there, and then the impact of climate change in terms of the uh, being in the hurricane zone. Work with, we work in areas like um, 
River Rouge, which actually I think Amina might talk about more in in um, in Detroit, where again there's a coal-fired power plant and a number of industrial facilities there. But then you also then it's also a community where folks are um, are low-income folks. So so it's the ironies of a place that is host to a coal-fired power plant, but probably has higher rates of shutoffs, whether it's their um, electricity or their even their water is. I think Amina will talk more about in terms of the Detroit situation. We worked out in the area called Four Corners out in in the west where Navajo communities out there who are living in the shadows of coal-fired power plants, and 70% of the people on those reservations don't have don't have running water and they don't have electricity, yet they are um, within a 50-mile radius. They have uh, four coal-fired power plants within 50-mile radius of their reservation that, that, w- that came in with a promise of jobs and electricity at least. They don't have the electricity because, like I said, 70% don't, of the folks on the on the lands don't have electricity. And even the jobs, they, they usually brought in the plants and brought in the workers. So in one of the a number of the families we've met with, the, the men in the homes were off working in a completely different state to bring in the revenue for their homes. So those are just some of the examples of the the types of situations of, of, of a lot of the communities we work in where people are have these compounded challenges around um, dealing with the toxins in their communities that are the same toxins that are driving cold, um, climate change, and then some of the same communities have these these vulnerabilities. But then on the other side, we are we are doing this work, and those communities are doing the work as well. And these communities have. Uh, you know, might have a lot of these vulnerabilities, but they also have assets as well. One being the the, the organizing and their commitment to seeing change in their communities, and their their talents and their innovation and their their um and their their various skills. So you see communities like Gulfport where they're actually making a transition now, and and they they through their activism, the coal fired power plant is going to stop burning coal in in March of this year where they have started a community garden project where they are they've started a number of community gardens connected to churches throughout their without throughout their um area where they are have green school um, a green school project going in their high school and one of their elementary schools where they're looking at the fact that they have all these storms and that they're flooding every year and they've actually started a stormwater management initiative so that they can actually bring in jobs to do the stormwater management infrastructure and save these homes many of whom many of which are in floodplains from the flooding that's happening so we are starting to see a lot of kind of hope and growth in these same communities that have so much have so much in the way of risk and vulnerability um, previously. So that's the kind of work that we're really work, you know, doing and both working on both sides of mitigation of these drivers of climate change like coal-fired power plants and otherwise, but then also working on um, equity-based adaptation and resilience building with communities really in the lead of deciding what their vision is and the type of community they want to live in and then leading on implementing those solutions. So... So with that, we strongly believe that um, that it does need to be um, communities in the lead because a part of the issues that we are having now is that we've had this non-people-centered development. Development comes in and it's just for the sake of profit. In Houston, you have a situation where they're so pro-profit, pro-business, that there's actually no zoning whatsoever. There are no zoning laws. So you see we visited a high school, the Cesar Chavez High School, where there's five oil refineries with in a 10-mile radius of that one school, and again, it's a Latino, Latin Amer- Latino American and African American school, and so we really started to, to to work with communities who are saying, no, this isn't working for our communities because it's usually the communities that have um, these vulnerabilities that um, that are most faced with those kind of situations. So we're starting to see where laws are beginning to change through community activism so that this non people centered development then begins to turn on its ear and communities start to have more of a voice in the types of development that's brought into their communities. We're also looking at the fact that even as we are, are uh, moving in this situation of climate change, that we have real adaptation through community leadership. Unfortunately, a lot of the pathways that folks are designing now are pathways to false 
false solutions. So instead of coal-fired power plants, they're looking at natural gas-fired power, power plants, which brings, as we know, a whole other set of challenges through fracking and so forth. And so the communities are rising up and saying no to fracking. So we have places like Denton, Texas, where there's a fracking ban. New York, they just put in a fracking ban. And this is through community leadership of, of solutions as opposed to um, profit-driven leadership of solutions. And then we also feel um, are, are finding that community of color and low-income community leadership means that there's more of an understanding of the holistic approaches that need to be employed in, in, in solution building because they live lives of intersectionality, meaning that they you know that, that that there's multiple areas of of um, vulnerability, but then also multiple assets and, and, and ways that you can really work on mitigating the vulnerabilities through emphasizing the assets. And so, so you have communities where, like Gulfport, like Longview, Texas, like Pritchard, Alabama, that are building on their assets to really mitigate their vulnerabilities and moving from a situation where they're more focusing on um, surviving to a situation where they're actually um, having a vision and a pathway to, to thriving. And so this is why we are working hard to make sure that the communities are, do have a place at the table to be able to, to exert that leadership um, because they, they do know the solutions that work for them. And so in my remaining, I think, two minutes or so here, um, I'll just wrap up by saying, and I know we have more time together, that in terms of uh, your engagement, I'm really just excited to see the room full of, of, of folks who are interested in hearing about this because it really is going to take us all to be able to, to turn this tide around. I mean, the statistics were given in the introduction in terms of where we are now. Fortunately, we have a lot of exciting things happening this year, like the Pope is giving an encyclical, which is like a kind of like a, a set of directives to his um, congregants or, or, you know, his masses to inform them to really get activated around around climate change. He's coming to the United States in September, and um, there's a number of groups that are organizing a moral march on climate at that same time. I don't know if folks heard that yesterday in Davos, Pharrell, Pharrell, um, we'll just call him Pharrell, <laughs> as if we're on first name basis, and um, Al Gore announced together that they are going to be launching another um, live Earth. They're, so they're going to be doing um, seven concerts throughout the world on um, uh, raising awareness on climate change. So whether it's at that level, the Pope and Pharrell and Al Gore, or whether it's these communities in the front lines who are who are really um, engaging in leadership, we're recognizing that it's going to take folks you know, folks everywhere doing their part. So it's exciting that you're there willing and interested to, to, to get involved. And we, we, we want folks to recognize that they don't have to be full-time environmental and climate justice folks or work full-time for an organization. Any, any small way that you can get involved, whether it's writing a letter, whether it's having a teaching moment in a conversation, or whether you are actually looking to work full-time in this work, there's so many avenues of, of being able to participate, just joining a group, whether it's a church group or a civic association, and being able to contribute um, contribute that group's might to this work in, in whatever way, whether they're lobbying or, or doing um, awareness raising sessions. And then we are working with, with um, Jackie Smith and so forth around building the connections between scholar activists and um, the frontline community work so that your ability around um, research, around analysis, around um, data can then lend to um, the frontline community advocacy work. Right now I'm working on this issue called net metering where a community can, um, a community or an individual can put solar panels and whether it's a solar garden in a community or a solar panel on your roof, and you can get, you can, um, if you generate more electricity than you use, you can get a rebate for that. But yet the opposition, meaning the energy companies, are trying to to turn um, frontline communities against it by saying that it means that people who can't afford solar panels are, are subsidizing solar panels for the rich. But if we had a group like a scholar activist, like the folks who are in the room, then we could work together on really doing the data that can counter the types of false arguments that industry is putting out. And um, 
We also talked about the impact of climate change and wanting to be able to document that better and document solutions that work so that then uh, frontline communities can get more funding to support their work. And that's another way that scholar activists and frontline communities can work together. And I'll just end by saying, too, that another, another exciting thing about folks who are in sociology and so forth that would help is to, is, is to really recognize this whole issue of intersectionality because so much of research focuses on one variable or one, you know, one type of scenario that focuses on one piece, and we really need to have more meta-analyses or, or analyses that really look at, at the intersection, intersecting factors. We need to change how research is done in a lot of ways to be able to accommodate the, inter the lives of intersection that a lot of these communities lead. So definitely looking forward to more discussion with you now and more hopefully work with you in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll hold questions, keep them in your back of your mind, and we're gonna switch over to Amina right now. And uh, okay. sorry, about, sorry about the technical glitch a little bit earlier. We fixed it as best we can. Um, can you so, hear me okay? Please. I don't need to speak a little louder. Yes, that's fine. Right? Okay. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, okay, that's great. Yes. Okay, Thanks. so hi everybody. My name is Amina Maxi. I'm the community outreach coordinator here in um, the city of Detroit. I work with a group called the Zero Waste Detroit Coalition. And so Zero Waste Detroit, just to give you a quick uh, summary of kind of, of the work that we do and the work that I do, um, I've done environmental justice organizing in Detroit since I graduated from University of Michigan. I studied with Professor Paul Mohai, who was a real um, one of the founders of the environmental justice movement and a real a great professor, as well as Professor Dorsita Taylor who's also a really great researcher in, the, in environmental justice work. Um, the aim though of the organization I work for, Zero Waste Detroit Coalition, is to really advance recycling within the city of Detroit. And that is actually sprung out of the fact that the city is, is home to the, to the country's largest um, waste incinerator where all the city's trash is burned. And so we do work to, con to continue to watchdog that facility as well as advanced recycling with the mindset that the less that we have to burn, the less, the less that we have to burn, the less of an impact on our health. Um, the third prong of our work, which is more of what I'll focus on, is really solidarity with other groups in the city, but also at the state level, who are also doing environmental justice work. Because what we have found is that while we are very issue specific as far as a one facility, we will not have any success unless we can work together and really amplify our efforts um, and, mobilize, and, and our mobilization um, abilities. Um, so the, I wanna kind of give you a, if you've never been to Detroit, I kind of wanna explain to you what it's like as a city. So the city of Detroit is a predominantly African-American city as over 80% African-American it's a large Latino population. There's also in the Metro Detroit area, um, a very large uh, Middle Eastern population as well. In addition to that, we are an environmental justice city. Um, it's very much, we're very burdened with a lot of environmental hazards and a lot of environmental pollution. And I give you this context to, so you can understand um, what where we come from in our organizing. We are home to over a dozen facilities such as the DTE coal-fired power plant, Severstall Steel, the incinerator, um, Marathon Oil Refinery, which we just saw this Obama State of the Union where he's talking about Keystone XL. Our oil refinery already processes tar sands that are coming from Canada. So we're already home to one of those facilities that has been um, ramp ramped up to take this really toxic tar sand. Um, we're home to in addition to that, De Detroit is really a low income community. The um, median uh, income level is around 25,000, but in the vicinity directly around the incinerator and in one community, 48217, which is a zip code of our city, that's the third most polluted zip code in the, in the state. And so um, those communities have even lower costs of living or lower, um, and I mentioned that because these are, environmental justice communities and there's a lot of environmental racism that's happening. And so one of the one of the things that we're working on and one of the things I think that um, 
has helped to combat that is we're part of a group called the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition. And our aim for participation in that is working with groups throughout the state outside of the city of Detroit, but working with groups in Flint, which is another um, environmental justice community, working with native folks on reservations who are dealing with climate justice issues as well, so that we can actually work with the state of Michigan to implement um, an environmental justice plan that we work together on to integrate into how the state operates, how they site facilities, how they regulate facilities, how they permit facilities, so that they integrate environmental justice principles and policies within that. So we have met with them and begun to work with them, and they've integrated some of the policies into their structure, but we're still, while the plan is adopted, it was adopted by one of our former governors, it hasn't been fully implemented. So that's really one of our main goals as a coalition is to see the plan go into, I'm a speaker with my hands, to see the plan really go into performance. Um, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about um, this conversation of sustainability versus survival or sustainability or survival. I, I sometimes feel like when you talk about sustainability, like if you come to a city where folks are dealing with day-to-day -day issues, dealing with having to pay for their rent, having to catch a bus, have a bus actually come and not wait an hour for a bus, you know, having to uh, pay their water bill, get their water turned on, take their kid to school, pay for, you know, find childcare. The the thing is not that folks of color or people who are low income care any less. I don't, I mean, I think you all know that. That's not the case at all. It's really at where is that on the list of the priority list of my life? And so the real thing is, is that, well, how do you talk to people in a way where you are communicating to them in a way that's real to their lives? And so I think right now, a lot of the times when we talk about sustainability is communicated in a way that translates to the current majority of the country. When you talk about the communities that bear the brunt of the majority of the pollution that is really causing climate change, that same terminology, that same lingo and verbiage doesn't work. And so the, I think that folks though, still in these communities, although they may not call it sustainability, they're totally very much being very sustainable. You know, they're, they're doing it out of necessity. So they're taking less showers because they, the water bill will be so high. Or they're taking public transit because that's what they're afforded, that's what they have to do. But even if they had a choice and had to choose, they would still do those things. And so I think that a lot of the times, the very communities that I think sometimes are the source of a lot of the problem that are sucking a lot of this energy from DTE coal for the mega mansions out in the suburbs so they can commute in their three cars to Detroit, you know, a lot of that attention there, I think also, I think a lot of the attention needs to go to folks who also are perpetuating the problem. Um, but that's not to like indict a group. I just think that is to put a different light on um, the issue. And then also when we talk about these climate change discussions, um, when you bring in the perspective of low income and people of color communities, um, it kind of changes the, the prevailing paradigm of how that conversation generally goes about when you talk about climate change. Because uh, I feel like a lot of times in climate change discussions, there's talk about the impact of climate change as if we're kind of waiting a few years for it to happen, you know, or we talk about how there will be water wars and it, over there in other parts of the country. We talked about the, the rise in, in um, we talked about the increase in temperatures, there's increased flooding, but I feel like because a lot of that impact is on people of color communities and low income communities, it's not as recognized because the human impacts that people kind of talk about happening in the US that are a few years off have been happening in these communities for years and will continue to happen whether or not people do anything about it. And it's really because, um, it's really because we are the home of, we, we are the source of the pollution that's resulting in this major climate change that's happening throughout the globe and throughout the United States. And so I know that was a lot longer than I intended to speak on that particular issue, but I really wanted to just 
great lift that up because I've been to, um, I went to the United Nations Conference of the Parties in Durban and in Cancun, and my perspective was totally changed about how per people perceive me as an American going into those countries. Going there, it was kind of like the pointing the finger at me, like, who are you? You're from the U.S. You guys are the source of all this crap. Like, what? Like, boo to you. What do you have to say? And I was like, hey, like, we have the same goals here. We, my community is suffering. We we die from asthma rates. We die from asthma twice as much as the rest of the folks in Michigan do. We are as much want to be a part of the solution as these other countries, these developing countries want the United States to be. But I think that a lot of the reason why this has gone on for so long and hasn't been lifted up is for the same reason that there had to be an entire campaign around Black Lives Matter. The reason is because our lives haven't mattered for a long time. And so just like the same reasons that, that you can see the actions that happened that precipitated all of this movement, those are the same reasons that continue to create environmental justice communities and are continue to be the reasons why nothing gets done. Um, so I feel like I just went on a, a little bit of a rant, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I really, I really just wanted to, I just kind of, I, I really appreciate this conversation and appreciate the, um, your university really lifting this up because this, these aren't conversations that happen often, you know. Um, as far as my, I would say for like, they, there was a question posed to Jackie and I of what advice we would have to give. I'm only 29. I graduated from college like, I don't know, seven years ago or something. And I would say for sure when I graduated, I was like hella naive, number one. But that's a good thing. And don't let, when you like, don't let that be discouraging once you like start to do work because you need it in order to like, you need that naivete to be able to um, do a lot of this work because it's really hard if you decide to take this work on. But if you don't, that's fine. My only advice would be that if you really want to embrace environmental work, that in my opinion, that you really should do true environmental work with consideration of everyone along the cycle of that work. So if you decide to go into manufacturing, if you decide to, you know, own your own business, if you decide to work for an environmental organization, when it comes to a decision, a lot of times people make the decision about something, not thinking about, oh, you know, I might live in that community, you know. Think about you know, the decision you're making from extraction to, to disposal. Our community is where a lot of, we are dealing with the pollution from manufacturing, we deal with the pollution from the disposal side of it, and if you, I think that if more people could put themselves in our shoes, they would do differently. If they had to live in 48217 for one minute and breathe the air they have to breathe or have see their niece have a asthma attack in the middle of the night and not breathe because not because of your the inside of your house or because you're not, you know, not taking care of things, but because just because of something totally out of your control, I think it would change the way people really think. So I just would ask you to have consideration of, along the entire cycle from extraction to disposal and think about how do people play into that. And then also, as you move forward, um, there's a lot of times there's a lot of false solutions that are perpetuated. One of the specific ones that we've had in Michigan was around renewable energy and inclusion of incineration as a form of renewable energy. So um, deeming it similar to solar, wind, geothermal. And so one of the things that we really had success around was recently in this last um, term, there was a bill to try and do that, to change the definition in Michigan, and we were successful in um, defeating that bill. And so that's something because we didn't want to see other communities have to deal with something like we have to deal with here with our incinerator. You know, we, the city of Detroit had us for the first time, another thing that we're excited about was we finally starting in, um, this year have our first citywide curbside recycling program. Think, doesn't me give you a comparison. The city of Ann Arbor, their first curbside recycling program was in 1986. So the reason why we haven't been able to have one for 20 years was because we were contractually obligated to send our trash to be burned. So, you know, it's, it's really, we're excited about that, that finally we can recycle, let's get behind it. 
Um, we also, like Jackie spoke about a little bit, there is a lot, you know, of pollution here, but the thing about Detroit that's like, you can't like sleep on is that people ha are, are really resilient. We have a lot of really exciting and really fun things going on. Like there's a lot of um, work going on in the city around uh, food. There's a lot of issues folks have with, uh, there's a lot of, there's lack of access to uh, healthy food. And so there's a lot of community gardens that have popped up and been going on throughout the city. There are also, um, you probably saw this in the news, we recently were having a lot, having problems with the city of Detroit shutting off folks' water. And so members of Zero Waste Detroit, like the East Michigan Environmental Action Council, the Sierra Club, other groups organized to uh, provide access to folks whose water was shut off and to organize with the city to stop the water shutoffs for folks because water is a human right. And so for as much as things continually continue to be like tried to take away, whittle, 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 the, whittled away, there's a lot of organizing that's happening and we need you, you guys and, and folks who will be scholars and who will be the decision makers to like truly, and I know it's cliche, but like put yourselves in our shoes, put yourself in the shoes of the person living next to the facility that you're permitting. Would that be you? Not just, just like Obama said with the minimum wage where he said uh, if you saw the state of the union he said live on fifteen thousand dollars a year if you're willing to to um not increase the minimum wage if you're willing to pass a bill if you're willing to cite a facility if you're willing to say that burning trash is the same as solar or wind then live next to that facility and then tell me other and tell me that you still say that thing so have that thought in your head as you move out into your careers so i, I am i'll stop there I'm not going to talk forever. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you both very, very much. All right. So uh, now we will open up the floor for questions. Hopefully you have a lot of burning questions that you want to ask, but not trash burning questions. Or maybe you do have trash burning questions. Uh, if you want to come up to the front, we have a little microphone here. It might be able to pick you up. Um, want to come up and ask your question. Um, you can come up and do it, or you can just try to yell it up uh, if that works, and then it will focus on you. So, um, okay, and yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks. I learned a lot. Um, I was just wondering, in your experiences, how has gentrification kind of affected the way you organize, and how do you deal with it? Were you able to um, Yes. Jackie, do you okay. want to argue? No, I'm thinking you would corner the market on that there in okay. Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the city of Detroit right now has been undergoing massive development and gentrification. And so, um, and I'll just, if you read the New York Times, if you read any of like the, any magazine or newspaper, there's some posh article about like, oh my gosh, the resurgence of Detroit, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And everybody here is kind of like, well, what about us? <laughs> We've been here for forever and we don't get any attention. Um, so the way, let me give you an example in my organizing how I've accommodated for gentrification. So the Detroit incinerator is located in um, next to the medical campus and the cultural uh, campus. And then adjacent to it on the other side is one of the poorest areas of the city. It's located amongst very middle class doctors, lawyers, an area that is heavily gentrifying. And so my organizing work recently was to, around um, an older issue because the incinerator has been stinking like garbage for the last five years. Like literally, it's horrible. And so because it's been located in an area that's been gentrifying, we've done work that we've done for the last four years. But in the last two years, because folks have been moving into that area and been receiving financial incentives to do so from certain universities and certain hospitals, the issue has made every single newspaper every start every form of press but then the the area of the city that has 10 times as many facilities with 10 times higher pollution has not received the same level of attention at all which is 48217 which is what i mentioned and so one of the things that we tried to do is amplify those issues anytime we're talking about the issues that are happening in um 
the neighborhood around the incinerator. And right now, the development and gentrification that's happening in Detroit is very inequitable, just straight up. So you, whatever you read, that's cool. But the reality here is that certain areas of the city are receiving a lot of money, but the majority of the neighborhoods, which is where people live, are not receiving a lot of money or attention. So that's my long answer to your question. So the other thing I will add briefly on that is that the work we're doing around adaptation, um, as communities are, are developing adaptation plans, the one of the hazards we're finding is that adaptation, how folks actually implement adaptation and whether it's led by the communities really, really defines the, the line between whether it actually becomes gentrification as opposed to like a community community that wants to revitalize their community and they're leading on the decisions that are made in terms of how it's done versus someone else coming in and saying we're going to do these certain things to make this to to in to develop these adaptation measures in this community that could actually end up resulting in in folks being adapted right out of their own land and then their own communities and and so it becomes a gentrification in some in some in these ways if it's not done very very intentionally. So we're seeing that happen in, in the Gulf in particular and in, in, in the post Katrina situation where folks where the kind of redevelopment that happens really results in gentrification and you have kind of land loss and people not being able to return. Um so that's something that we're really trying to work intentionally on um in terms of equity and resilience building. And in fact I think tomorrow we are launching a, a tool around what, what are the indicators that we need to look at to ensure that there's equity as we do this this adaptation planning. And a number of those of those indicators focus on the extent to which gentrification is what's happening versus a community-led rebuilding process. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for that. Are there any other questions or follow-ups to that? Uh, Sage. Hi. Um, so a lot of us are involved in a lot of environmental clubs on campus, and we have, you know, it's great. We have a lot of people involved. There's a lot of excitement, but we're not diverse at all. Almost everyone has the same, you know, white middle class background, and we all have privilege to kind of foster this passion about sustainability. Um, and even looking around this room, you know, it's kind of a pattern that we see all throughout events in the university involving sustainability. Um, do you have any advice about how to kind of overcome that and be more inclusive and try to diversify our groups at all? Because it is an issue that's important to everyone, um, but, you know, we're pretty homogenous at the moment. I'm going to, do you want me to? You can go ahead, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So one one thing um, that actually we're coming out with next week. Um, I had a very busy holiday season. I don't know how to really take a break. Is um, is this guide called um, in, intersectionality and environmental justice? Integrating intersectionality and environmental justice in classrooms. Because and, and it's actually a guide that that has a number of lesson plans and ways that you can teach kids. At the at the elementary and high school level, about environmental issues in a way that's actually relevant to their lives um, in terms of EJ communities, and and so it's um, it's a lot more resonant than the way that than the way that environmentalism is talked about or has been traditionally talked about, because. The way it the way it gets framed, the way it gets characterized, the dominant narrative around um, around environmentalism doesn't sound relevant to a community that you know has kids being shot down in the street or has all these other things happening um, that are kind of urgent and in folks in the faces of different folks. So starting there is one of the places that we really are trying to start in terms of elementary and high school to get to have kind of the framing that, that is relevant for folks to really understand and connect to around environmentalism so that by the time they reach where you are now, there's, there's already been kind of a sensitization that's grounded in the reality of the lives of the folks who are, you know, of diverse communities. So. So that's not really kind of an advice for something that you can do, but it's just something that kind of gives you hope for future generations. But um, in terms of now, I mean, one of the things that, that we're doing now, because, I mean, I get the same thing. When I 
first started doing this work within the NAACP, I would go to the annual conventions and I would have a session on the agenda called Climate Justice 101. And people would come in and by the end of the session, they were like, that was really interesting. We thought that this was going to be about the climate of workplace discrimination. <laughs> like literally someone said that to me at one time. <laughs> um, so, so it was so far away from what they thought the NAACP agenda was. It just didn't even occur to them that it could have been about something related to the environment. And but but it, again in that session it really helped because I really used like a story based approach to really help folks to connect. So what I do also I'll just end by saying in my office what I've done to get folks engaged like literally at the office like in terms of just general staff is have a monthly film screening with issue with a video that really ties environmental issues with again the everyday lives that people are living. So Spike Lee's If God is Willing and the Creek Don't Rise and other films that actually tie it to the lives of folks who are living every day. So I would advise that as kind of film is just really a powerful film and story is really a powerful way to draw people in and help people to see um, the connections to the lives that they're living. And I think that, and another thing I'll also just say is that I'm sitting in the Sierra Club offices right now. I just did a set an anti-oppression training with this group called Energy Action Coalition, which you guys might know. And I'm actually sitting in the office of the student, the Sierra Student Coalition, um, just borrowing her office. And one thing that they did it was the Sierra Club is that they actually went out and they, you know, they participated in a lot of the Ferguson, the Ferguson activities to really recognize that it needs to be a leaning in and a real connection to the same systemic oppression that results in situations like, you know, there being a city council with no African Americans in a city that's 60% African American or having a police force that's predominantly white in a city that's predominantly black and have someone whose life was so devalued they were shut down the street like that. It's completely connected to communities that are disproportionately dumped on or, or, or put toxins poured down their lungs and so forth. So um, Sierra Club has a way to go, but they're trying to take that step to recognize those connections by participating in the Ferguson event, so really leading into the events that, that are really in the, in the face, in the front of these communities um, that, that you're trying to draw into the environmental realm. So those are the kind of a smattering of, <laughs> of, of ideas around that. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so just to, I'll, I would add to what Jackie's saying is that if you want to diversify and see that your, that your groups are, di are more diverse, like she said, is that you, then you have to, to either take on the issues that are of interest in relation to the environment of, um, people of color. And so, the, but the thing about that is, is that just like anything else, if something has been a certain way for a long time, you know, there may be the goal or the intention of this, but it may take a step back from from you, or may you may have to be uncomfortable for a little while just to provide that space. I don't mean that that anybody gets a free for all and does whatever they want, but you have to also. It's kind of like a give and take as far as what those specific things are. I don't know. I'm not in association with people of color on your campus. And then another thing that I'll say, and I'll give a example. So, the zero waste Detroit is. One of our members is the Sierra Club, um, and their Sierra Club Environmental Justice Office and their Great Lakes Programs Office. That's actually where I am right now, too. So it's funny, <laughs> Jackie. Yeah, it's so um, <laughs> their staffer, uh, Melissa Damaski, she is with their Great Lakes Program. She's a white woman, and she um, does work uh, around the Great Lakes region in regards to water. Every year, her, Rhonda Anderson, who's the EJ um, program person or the Beyond Coal person for Sierra Club, as well as other staffers that are in this office, go to the White Privilege Conference every year. It's not like most is like, oh yeah, I got it. I went, I got this. You know. So if you, another thing that I would say would be helpful would be um, to understand, and it's not. I generally don't talk about white privilege, uh, being honest, with white folks because I don't. It doesn't seem to go over well. So what I will say, this, this has been my experience. So but what I say is just that it's, it's helpful to have that understanding so that you can know some of the things that are that are happening and the reason why it might not be, people may not be engaging, you don't even know it. So, and the, the white, the, it doesn't have to be the conference, but just having a, an understanding of, of yourself as well as the other, per, the other groups. So that, those would be my suggestions. I hope that was helpful. Thank you. I, I would just like to add to that, in case any of you haven't seen it, there is a summit on 
racism this weekend in East Liberty. So if you are interested in going, there are several panels available, and um, there is one session specifically dedicated to environmental issues. Uh, and the person running that session is here today. <laughs> and I just like and, to right, uh, thank you for all the Sierra Club shout outs. Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for Francisco and, the, and Jamaica here are the local Sierra Club representatives, so you can. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, thank you for joining us. And tell Rhonda I said hi. I will. What's your name? <laughs> Randy Francisco. Randy, okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> We have, a, I think, time for maybe one or two more questions. Sarah. Um, I'm not on the camera. Is that okay? Uh, maybe you can just okay. squeeze over. Hi. Um, Hi. Okay. <laughs> so my question is about language, actually. So I've sort of been noticing about most social justice issues as a student that um, they almost speak social justice activists and academics. They tend to speak a similar language, um, and I guess uh, there's a big gap in that language between those activists and policymakers. And I sort of wanted to know how you guys deal with, I mean, you're discussing things like intersectionality, and these things are very, like, not on the, the minds of policymakers. And I'm wondering how you guys deal with that sort of language gap almost. Yep. Yep. Sure? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so it's very simple. It's kind of like how I grew up. So I grew up in uh, rural Michigan, and then my family was all in Detroit. So I can, I am a, what do you call it? What do they call it, Jackie, when we do the, um, I can put on different hats. So I oh, think yeah. that when I'm talking to policymakers, I do not talk to them like that. I, I don't use those words. You see the glaze over in their faces, and you lost them. So it's like when I'm talking to them, you you have to know what they're willing to hear and which frame they're going to hear, which um message they're going to hear it from. So, you know, a lot of times, especially in Michigan, because of our economy, because of um, jobs, it's very much about like jobs and numbers and dollar signs. But I can still like my, my point is always the same. It's just coming from a different like coming from a different angle, because I, when I was younger, I totally came in like talking about those things and they weren't willing to hear that, at least at the state level um, in the city of Detroit. Just to give you an, <laughs> our city council meetings, people yell and finger point and curse at our council, and they do it back. Like our style is very different. So you can do that there. I can't go to this, not that I curse or anything to them, but and when you go to the state, you can't do that. So you have to know what is the most effective way to message to that person. And so that's, that's kind of how I would say it. Yeah, I would pretty much affirm the same, the same thing. Um, and I, so both in terms of how I use my language, but also even in terms of working with others and helping them to message how both to talk to our, um, you know, how to talk to, to, to lawmakers, but then in terms of other folks have it, how to talk to frontline communities in a way that makes sense, that really kind of matches in terms of language and relevance. So it really is about tailoring to whatever audience it is. Um, so I think I'm going to say it very well. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to say one more thing before I know this is the last question. Um, I just want to say something as students, like about how important and I think like how much I think it's great that you guys are here in this lecture, but also being a student, I remember sitting <laughs> where you're sitting and looking, you know, maybe not at a screen, but at a person talking and <laughs> Um, <laughs> you you know so much, and whatever, whatever community you go into, a people of color community, and I see there's not students in the room too. Hey y'all, um, but wherever you go, whatever community you go into, I know how smart you are. But like sometimes as a student, you're so eager, and you go out and you're in a new community with new people. But sometimes, like I would say, take a step back and get to know people, and gain and earn your respect in in the community if you're organized in a way that um, isn't always about like what you know and what you think and what's right. And I think that that sometimes my experience has been even a little bit how I might have been. That can be the, the experience that a lot of new folks have when they go in. They have all these great ideas and they're so excited, but it's kind of like um, there's a lot of like really seasoned folks in the field who also know a lot and a lot of elders who also know a lot. So it's just how you enter a community is very important. So that's, I just wanted to say that. Okay. 
Uh, anything else? Any other final quick questions? I could maybe get a quick answer. Okay. Nothing? Okay. Well, then, um, I think we're about out of time then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you both very, very much. For the time. Thank you. It was great. It was great to hear from you both. It was great uh, what you said, what you talked about about organizing and getting involved. And I think it's words that uh, everybody can use. Uh, everybody can do something with to go out and do something with to, to give us, you know, the agency to actually, again, uh, get involved and make the changes that we hope we can. So okay. thank you again very much and. Uh, also, there are, for everybody involved, there is a series of background readings available on the website for this speaker series, if you haven't seen them already. Um, Jackie has sent us a few already, some of the pieces that she's written, and uh, hopefully if they have, if Jackie or Amina have any more things that they want to share with us, we can put them up there for you, for your own access. The, the, the report that uh, Jackie mentioned about um, was the one that's coming out next week or this week? Oh, right, yeah. I was like, which one? Um, yeah, you I said, can send you. one of them already, yeah. Yes, that's true. I'll, I, I can send you both of the ones that I mentioned. The one that's coming out tomorrow and the one that's coming out next week. Um, would, I'll send you, yeah. That would be great. Okay. We'll put them up on okay. the website along with it. All right, okay, thank great. you very much. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <coughs>